Hey, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Good to see you guys. Let's stand together. Welcome to Christ Church. If we haven't met, my name is Joshua. I get to serve as one of the worship leaders here at this church. And uh, let me ask you this morning, what kind of worshiper are you gonna be today? I thought of that last night. I came in early yesterday after having a hard day, just wanting to give myself a few extra hours to prepare my heart before last night's service. And I just sensed the Lord kind of asked me, what kind of worshiper are you gonna be in the midst of your circumstance, in the midst of the thing you're going through, in the midst of the, the trial? What kind of worship leader are you going to be tonight? And each of us, without the title of worship leader, are worshipers. We're made in the image of God, called to bring glory to Him. And so, may I just be an encouragement to you that in the midst of whatever you're going through, God can redeem that and use that. He wants to this morning. But are you coming with the expectation that you are going to meet with the living God? That as you sing out, as you cry out, as you lay before the Lord the thing that you're going through, that He will pick you up, He will make it right, He will restore again, and He will use your life for His glory. I see a lot of nodding heads. I know that's why we're here together. So if that's the kind of worshiper you're going to be, let me just remind you the character of God and what he is going to be for us together today. This is Psalm 27. For he will hide me in the shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent and he will lift me high upon a rock. And now... My head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, and I will make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. For you have said, seek my face. And my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. I've gone to church for decades. Again, this Sunday is no different. I do not want to mail it in. I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to sing truth that I've sung for years and years and years. I want to meet today with Jesus Christ again. I want to be filled again by his spirit. I want to be reminded again of the Father's goodness. And I want that for you. So can we be that church together today? Amen? Can we be that church? The church that the Lord wants his people to hear his worth and his faith. Let's sing this to him. We want to give you pure exaltation. Open the What is yours, Jesus? Receive what is yours. Say worthy. Worthy are you, God? Worthy is your name. Worthy of all praise. We worship you. Here we stand in.
Amen. Amen. Go ahead and grab your seats. Welcome to Christ Church. So thankful to be worshiping with you this morning. Guests, so thankful that you joined us. My name is Gabe. I serve on our community life team. If you had a chance to stop at the guest tent on your way in, you should have received a guest card. That is an invitation for you to let us know that you are here. You can do that digitally by scanning the QR code or manually and drop it in one of the black boxes on your way out. If you walked right by that tent, just want to invite you to the carpeted area in the lobby after service. Our team would love to meet you and personally thank you for joining us this morning. Our next step of engagement here at Christ Church beyond worship service is a consider meeting. If you have not taken that step, I want to invite you to one of our next ones coming up next weekend on October 19th or 20th. You can get more information about those um, on the app or on the website. Speaking of the Christ Church app, Church Family, be sure to head there to the dashboard for personalized news and events. Be sure to fill out a communication card and let us know how we can serve you and pray for you this week as we pursue discipleship together. Church family, if you're online and unable to join us, we miss you. Be sure to fill out that communication card as well so that we know how to pray for you this week. Well, we give as an act of worship to God. So whether you give online or whether you um, give through the boxes in the back, we just want to take a moment to consecrate our gifts to the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, we as your people understand that we are merely stewards of your resources. So Lord, help us be a people marked by contagious generosity. And Lord, would you use our gifts um, to make much of yourself and to further your kingdom and your glory. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together again. Sing to you this morning, Jesus. Creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. ourselves to you, Lord. I won't bow to words. I 
stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. No, I won't.
to mean those words. To see you high lifted up, our King in glory and majesty, splendor and wonder. That's who you are. That's who we're singing to, Lord. Remind us again. Such a 
Our text this morning is Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. Last week we stopped mid-sentence, so I am gonna start reading in verse 19 so we have some momentum going into today. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might? that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all. These are God's words for us today. Let's have a seat together. Amen, let's pray together. It's so right, Lord, that we sing of the awesome God that you are. We are gathered this morning piling up phrases doing our best with our limited understanding and our limited vocabulary to testify to the matchless greatness of who you are and what you've done. Our words don't reach the fullness, but they're right that we give you praise, that we declare, that we rejoice in the truth that you have shown us in your word and the power of the Holy Spirit pointing to your magnificent son who makes you fully known. So we thank you, we're grateful this morning as we gather in this place for the awesome God that we serve. We're thankful for the kind of God who sets his love upon us when we are dead in trespasses and sins, when we are full bore in rebellion, running away from you, hating you. You set your love on us and loved us back to life in great kindness, in rich mercy. There's no other God like you. Awesome in saving power. And not only that, but you then lavish gifts upon us, grace upon grace. You bring us into your people, the church. You fill us with your Holy Spirit. You give us the word of God where the truth of God is known and the power of God is experienced. You appoint us to gather together and to build one another up in our most holy faith as we sing together and pray together and sit under your word together and meet you at your table together and all of these wonderful ways that you continue to give us life and life abundant. Lord, you are an awesome God and we're grateful this morning and we're grateful that you beckon us into the privilege of prayer that you invite us to come before the throne of grace, that you promise us an open ear and a mighty outstretched arm in answer to the prayer, the heart cry of your people. And so my prayer this morning as we open these last few verses of Ephesians chapter one is that you would work through this text in the power of your spirit to make us into a people of prayer, joyful prayer, hopeful prayer, Persistent prayer, believing prayer, confident prayer. Would you make us as a church, a people of prayer, one for another and for the mission of God around the world? And we ask it in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you. My name is Nathan. I'm glad to be with you on this Sunday morning, and I would invite you to join me in Ephesians chapter 1. Turn your Bible on or open it up and Make your way to Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, if that helps. General Electric Power Company is how I remember it. I want you to put your eyes on God's word. I want you to be able to track with me as we look at this just magnificent text this morning. And as you find uh, Ephesians chapter one, I wanna take you back to my childhood home growing up. I grew up in God's country in East Tennessee uh, on a little 12-acre farm on the top of a hill, right in the kind of the foothills of the Smoky Mountains. I, I still haven't forgiven my parents for moving, 
But as the oldest of six kids on that 12-acre farm, I had the privilege, I was told it was a privilege, uh, to work, uh, especially related to the yard, of which there was about eight acres, uh, and the fence row. We had fences for days because we kept trying to have different kinds of animals. Animals never fared very well uh, with my family, but we tried. We had horses and goats and chickens, and we, that just meant we had lots of fences because they all needed to be in their proper place. And so uh, it was my privilege uh, to tend these fence rows. And I lived, as my children remind me frequently, I lived in the 1900s. <laughs> this, was, this was before they had the 18-volt battery packs that could plug into your tools and run all day. So I had to run extension cords from the barn down the fence row to where I needed the saw to work or the drill to work or whatever it is that, that I was uh, doing. And so I vividly remember my father um, allowing me uh, to string these cords together. There was probably four or five of them in a row to make it down far enough. Uh, I don't know, think the fire marshal would approve, but that's what we, we do what we had to do. And we, I would get down to the place, a couple of hundred yards away from the barn, where I needed the power, and I would pull the trigger, and nothing would happen because in my pulling and traveling, uh, the, the cords had disconnected somewhere back up the chain. Do you know this feeling? And so my dad let me do that a few times, and then he, he uh, observing my lack of problem-solving skills, he said, let me show you what to do. And so he told me how to tie the ends of the cord together so as they pulled, they wouldn't pull apart. They wouldn't lose the connection. And when I got where I needed to go uh, and I pulled that trigger, the power would be available to me uh, no matter where I was on the fence row. The issue in Paul's mind as he closes the prayer in Ephesians chapter 1 is power. He is praying, do you see it there? That we would know the immeasurable greatness, this is verse 19, of God's power toward us who believe. So he's praying for believers, those who have been united to Christ by faith and are now following Christ by that same faith. He's praying that believers would know that they would that they would not just have cognitive awareness in their brains, but they would experience in their life. They would, they would know the power of God, not just in the past moment of our salvation, as he brought us from death to life by his mighty power, not just in the future moment of our glorification, as he makes us like his son, as we behold him and become like him, but in our daily moment by moment, as we follow God, as we follow Christ, that the power of God would be at work shaping our daily lives and our daily discipleship. That's Paul's prayer for believers, that we would know continually the mighty power of God. Specifically, as we heard last week, Paul is praying that we will experience God's power at work in our lives in the place of prayer. In the place of prayer. The issue on Paul's mind as he closes his prayer is power. How can Paul be confident that God will work in these believers as he prays for them? How can Paul be confident that we can know, that we can be confident that God will work through our prayers for one another? How can we have what Ephesians 3 verse 12 will later call boldness and access with confidence in the presence of God in the place of prayer? The key to our confidence is right there in verse 19. Paul prays that we would know the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, now watch this, according to, there it is, there's the key, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ. The, the immeasurable great power of God in our life is according to the mighty working of God in Christ. What does that mean? How is God's power in my life connected to God's power in the life of Christ? How does this help my confidence, Paul, as I go to pray for my brothers and sisters? Well, if God's power toward Christ was just like an example of the kind of power that God has, 
that does not give me confidence in prayer. Because I might look at that example and see that God has that power, but there's no guarantee there that he will use that power through my prayer or for me. I'm glad God has it, but how can I know that he'll use it as I pray? And so we pay attention to what Paul says. He does not say that the power that he worked toward Christ is just an example of the kind of power he has. No, he says that God's power in my life is according to the great might that he worked in Christ. There is an accord. There is a cord. There is an extension cord that runs from Christ's life to my life. My life is plugged in to Christ's life. He is the power supply for my life. What is true of Christ is what is true of me. So when I see the way God worked in Christ, I have confidence he is at work in the same kind of way in and through my life in the place of prayer. I am connected to him in a way that cannot be pulled apart. So the big idea for our time in Ephesians 1, 20 to 23 this morning is that Jesus is my cause for confidence in prayer. Jesus is the reason, if I can say it this way, that when I go to pull the trigger in prayer, I know that it will work, it will be effectual. There will be divine power at work doing what only God can do as I pray because I pray in Jesus' name. When I see the immensity of God's power at work in Christ, that's why, that's, this is where Paul's gonna point our attention this morning. It's just like, look at what God did in Jesus because when we see that immense power and we see ourselves believing in him and trusting in him, united to him by faith, then we know that immeasurable greatness of power toward us as we pray in Christ's name. You tracking with that big idea? We're connected to the power supply. So Paul's gonna end his prayer just rejoicing in Jesus and God's, the greatness of God's power at work in Christ's life, which gives us confidence of that same kind of power at work as we pray in Jesus' name. So how can we have confidence in prayer? Why, why do I come into the place of prayer for my brothers and sisters, confident that God will move at the sound of my voice? Number one, we can have confidence in prayer because God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Verse 20, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand. Do you remember how much work went into asking your parents for something when you were a little kid? especially if it was like something that was important to you that you really needed to see happen. Like, step number one is you had to figure out who was like, who was the child du jour? You know, like who's the favorite child right now? Because that's probably the one you want to send with the request. And then you had to figure out like how many chores you had to do to get some leverage over mom and dad. Like not only did I make my bed, I made your bed, mom. So I think we should go to Disneyland. <laughs> and then you had to do a little bit of recon before you went in with your request to find out like what kind of mood is dad in? Because if his team just lost in overtime, like that's probably not an auspicious time to make your request known to your father. You should probably wait and pick a better time. Our confidence in prayer can suffer for a lot of those same reasons. We aren't sure what kind of mood God is in. Is now a good time to go into his presence? We don't know how many good things we need to do to make him happy with us, especially in light of all those other things that we did before. We wonder who we should send to talk to him about that instead of going ourselves. Like, who's most likely to have his ear in this situation? 
That lack of confidence, do you feel that? That lack of confidence has nothing to do with doubting God's ability. Of course, he can answer. What we doubt is his affection for us. Or what we doubt is his attention to us as we come before him in prayer. And so, to strengthen our confidence in prayer, Paul reminds us God has dealt with your sin in such a way that if you are believing in Jesus for your right standing before a holy God, he is perfectly pleased with you. And you are perfectly pleasing to him. He has reconciled himself to you and you to him in the death and resurrection of Jesus. There's nothing that you can do. There's nothing that you need to do to bargain with him or get leverage with him or make it up to him. He can't be any more pleased with you than he is in Christ. And the way that Paul does this is to point to the power of God at work when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand. That, that raised Christ from the dead. So that resurrection is what I'm, I'm zeroing in on. The resurrection, of course, it builds on the life of Christ. Jesus lived a truly human life in perfect obedience to the Father's word. Every thought, every inclination of the will, every affection of the heart, every act of the body was in perfect alignment with the will of God. A perfect life, a sinless life, an obedient life, the life of Jesus. And then, Paul references here, his death, where he laid that perfect life down as a substitutionary payment for all of those who would believe in him for salvation. A, the kind of payment that will cover over our sin. The kind of payment that will turn away the wrath of God in judgment upon us as sinners. The kind of life that will clothe us in a perfect, radiant, impeachable, unimpeachable righteousness. And Paul says, I want you to see the life of Christ. I want you to see the death of Christ for you, but let's not stop the story there. Where I want to focus is the resurrection of Christ, the power of God when he raised Christ from the dead. And I think the reason that he focuses here is if you picture the, the cross as like Jesus writing the check, my life for their life, like my blood for their sacrifice, Jesus offers his life to the Father, he writes the check, on Good Friday, the reason that Paul calls our attention to the resurrection is because that's where the Father cashes that check, where he accepts that payment, where you see that for sure Christ's sacrifice accomplished what he said it would do. The Father has welcomed it, has received it, has accepted it, has guaranteed it. The life and the death of Christ are cashed, as it were, are applied to you, are demonstrated to be sufficient to cover your sin and provide your righteousness at the resurrection. Are you tracking with that? Like, without the resurrection, there is no good news. With a perfect life and a substitutionary death, if that's the end, there's no gospel. We need to see God validate, receive, testify of his approval of, God, of Christ's sacrifice for you and for all of those who will trust in him. And that's what we see in the resurrection. And Paul points our attention. I want you to see the power of God raising Jesus from the dead because there's a cord that runs from Christ's life, death, and resurrection to your confidence in prayer. Namely, when you come before the throne of God, you come before the throne of the God who has accepted the life and death of Christ on your behalf. You find a throne of grace when you come before the throne of the universe because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Jesus, because of Jesus, you are perfectly pleasing to your heavenly Father. I hope that hits your heart as good news this morning. But you know, maybe, maybe you're not doubting his affection that's not what keeps you tentative in the place of prayer. Maybe you're doubting his attention. You struggle to have confidence in prayer because God seems 
so remote, not angry, just distant, like he's a spirit which you can't see, and he's in the heavenly places where you can't go, at least not right now. And where he is and who he is, he just seems so much further away than your voice can reach. Have you ever tried to yell in the wind down the beach? And you're like, I can see you. You can't hear me, though, because it's like your words just melt into the air as soon as they come out of your mouth. Like, your words aren't going where you want them to go. They're not doing what you want them to do. It's just like they just kind of evaporate into the ether as you yell into the wind with the roar of the waves. And, and sometimes prayer can feel like that as we're trying to talk with God. And so to strengthen our confidence in prayer, Paul reminds us not only has Christ died and been raised in the sense of come out of the grave on the third day, he has been raised in the sense of he has ascended into heaven and been seated at the right hand of the Father. The right hand. The right hand is the place of honor. The right hand is the place of the the exercise of authority. At the king's right hand, that's the place of proximity. Nobody's closer to the king than this. It's the place of intimacy. This, This is the one the king listens to. This is the one who has been given the king's ear. And scripture shows us not only that Jesus is seated at God's right hand, but he is not silent. He is working on our behalf. He sends his Holy Spirit to fill us. He silences the voice of the accuser that comes against us. He pleads the merit of his blood over us. Father, I bought that promise for my precious brother, my sister. And Hebrews 7 says that he's praying for us. He's the kind of high priest that can save to the uttermost because he ever lives to make intercession for us. We don't think a lot, I don't I don't think a lot about what happens between the resurrection of Jesus and the return of Jesus. But it's very important I think that we remember that God raised and seated his son, our savior at his right hand and it's important because Jesus is not silent, he's working for you and it's important because Jesus isn't just up there working for you. He's in you by his Holy Spirit. And you, as Paul says all through the book of Ephesians, you are in him. He opens the letter in chapter 1 and verse 1 with the declaration that the saints in Ephesus are faithful in Christ Jesus. You're in him. He's in you. If Christ, listen, If Christ is your life, if you are connected to him, united by faith, filled with his Holy Spirit, the center of gravity of your life is not here. It is not here in the midst of these circumstances. It doesn't mean this is not real. It just means it's not most real. It doesn't determine how things go for you. The center of gravity for your life, what determines what is everlastingly true of you is in heaven, where Christ is at the right hand of the Father, which is why Paul will make up new words in Ephesians chapter two as he tries to press onto our hearts the significance of our being in Christ and him being in us. He makes up words. In the Greek language, we have been raised up together with Christ. That's a new word. You have been seated together with Christ in the heavenly places. Do you hear that? It's not just that he's been raised and seated, but you're in him. And so you, in a, in a mysterious, spiritual, but marvelously true way, are seated also in Christ at the Father's right hand. What does that mean for your prayer? There's a cord connecting God's work in seating Christ and his work in responding to your prayer. Namely, as you pray in Jesus' name, as you pray in light of who he is and what he's done and where he is and where you are in him, as you pray in Jesus' name, you are not yelling down the beach into the wind. Your words are not melting as they come out of your mouth. God is not remote and needing to be jarred into paying attention to you. 
You are praying in the one who has the Father's ear. He is praying for you. You are praying with him as close as can possibly be. Reason, I think, for great confidence. You have the Father's affection in Christ. You have the Father's attention in Christ. So the number one cause of your prayer with confidence, that you can know that the power you need will be available to you in the place of prayer as you pray in Jesus' name, is that God raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. You got that? Does that sound good? Number two, you can have confidence in prayer because that Jesus is exalted over all. Is exalted over all, and all means all. L- listen to this, verses 20 and 21. Seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Don't you just love that? Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna list the things I can think about and then I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna remind you that any other name you can name, any other thing you can think about now or forever, Jesus is exalted over all of that. Maybe some of us don't struggle with confidence in prayer. But the reason that we don't struggle with confidence in prayer is that we are not in touch with our desperate need. Maybe we pray for things that are so small that we feel like we can tackle them in our own strength. Like how many of the rest of you make a list of things you've already done so you can have the pleasure of checking them off your list? Sometimes we pray like that. I think I pretty much got this handled. Or maybe we don't feel our need for our confidence in prayer because we have lots of other viable options for help, we think. And so God's power in prayer doesn't seem to be determinative. Like it doesn't really make or break the answer. And I, I think we could learn a lesson from our children here in this regard as well. Sorry for all the childhood illustrations. My oldest turned 21 this week, so it's just been a week of reflection uh, and remembering as parents do for these milestones in their children's lives. So lots of kids' examples this week. You remember the way that for children, not only is everything an emergency, but they know exactly where they need to go in that emergency. You have children like that, maybe you were a child like that, you've seen kids like that for sure. They fall down, the dryer is scary, the cat is mean, whatever, and they just take off running. Like this is an emergency. And they know exactly where they need to get. They will not stop for anything to get to mom. Oh, am I the only one that had a kid like that? (laughs) Like they will run past the president of the United States, you don't have anything for me. They will run past Taylor Swift. Not a bad idea, by the way. (laughs) They will either run past dad and leave him having to process it some 20 years later. (laughs) Because they need to get to mom because they know that mom has what they need and everything that they need, mom has. And if mom has it, they need it. Like this is an emergency and there's only one place that I can go for sufficient Support, care, comfort, encouragement. Mom's the one that I need no matter what it is I need. And Paul's point here is you should be like that when you pray. There's only one person who has what you need. And he has what you need no matter what you need. You need safety or structure. He's above all other rulers. You need leadership or direction. He's exalted above every other kind of authority. You need the power to bring transformation or to accomplish change in your life. You need the dominion to take control over an area in your life. He's got all of that in spades. In fact, he's exalted over every other need that you could possibly name today or when it comes into your mind tomorrow. He has it, and he has more of it than anyone else. And nothing that any other source has compares with what he has. I don't think the point here is to make so much out of the distinctions between the four terms. Like, what's the difference between a leader or 
you know, a ruler or a dominion or an authority or a power. The point is, whatever you need for help, you need him. Because any other help is a lesser help. Any other strength is a lesser strength. Because he's exalted over them all. So to increase our confidence in prayer, Paul is connecting God's work, his mighty power that he worked in Christ when he exalted him above every other name that is named over all creatures, physical creatures, spiritual creatures, all other powers. He's connecting a cord between that mighty exaltation of Christ above every other source and supply and his work in answering your prayer when you pray in Jesus' name. You can have confidence that you will experience God's power in answer to your prayer because the one in whose name you pray is above every other name. There's no red tape that Jesus has to like navigate through. There's no insufficient funds. There's no shipping delays. There's no like, I'd really love to help you, but we're gonna have to speak to a manager. There's none of that kind of finagling when you pray to Jesus. He doesn't have to bring any other power into account to answer your prayer. He is the power. He is the authority. He is the dominion. He is the wisdom. Why would you go? You feel this? Why would you go anywhere else? Do you want to go to the people that the king has his feet up on? As he will say in the next phrase, put him under his feet? Or do you want to talk to the king who is exalted over all? Get in, losers. We're going to prayer, right? That's the logic of this second point. After quoting Mean Girls, I feel like I should move on to point three. We can have confidence in prayer because God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him. We can have confidence in prayer because he exalted him over all other sources of supply or help. And three, we can have confidence in prayer because this exalted Jesus, listen, best part of the morning, has been given to the church. Verses 22 and 23. He put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It's the first mention of the church in this letter. It's the first mention of Christ as the head of the church. First mention of the church as the body of Christ. All three of those ideas are gonna become very important for Paul as he moves forward, but he brings them in here to address, I think, a common temptation that we face in prayer. How, how many of us know the sense of hesitation as we begin to pray or we begin to think about praying, wondering if we have already prayed too much for that? There's a kind of timidity we feel where we disqualify ourselves from asking for that grace again, that gift again, us again, asking for that again. We disqualify ourselves, and so we are not confident in the place of prayer. Listen, we're happy. We know the theology. We're happy to admit that God welcomes us into his holy presence in Christ. We have his affection and his attention because Christ died, raised, and is seated at the Father's right hand. We are happy to admit there's no better source that I could go to. That's why I've been going to Jesus. He's exalted over all rule, authority, power, and dominion, but we still hesitate. We still lack confidence because like, we've needed so much lately. Our prayer quota, we imagine, has got to be full by now, and so we shuffle kind of to the back of the line. And to fill us then with confidence that we can know the power of God in answer to our prayers for one another, Paul points that Listen, God has given him, he's given him to the church. He's given Christ. Listen, he didn't give you an allowance of Christ that you have to spend wisely so it doesn't run out before next payday. 
He didn't give you a timeshare of Christ that you can only use if somebody else doesn't get on the calendar first. He didn't give you a Christ quota that you have to make sure not to go over. It doesn't work like Jesus, with Jesus like it works with my power company where I have to make sure to draw power on off-peak times or it gets really expensive in the summer months. That's not what has been given to us. Christ himself has been given to us. The person of Jesus is yours, and you are his. You're connected to Jesus, not like my home is connected to the power grid through a utility contract. You are connected to Jesus like a head with a body. When Paul picks back up on the body image in chapter 5, he's making the point, listen, he says, no one ever hated his own body his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Do you hear the good news in that? Listen, when you pray, you are asking for things that Jesus feels the need for as strongly as you do because you are identified with him. You don't hate it when your body asks for things, do you? Like your head doesn't roll its eyes when you need to sleep again. You slept last night. When you need to eat again, like that was just two and a half hours ago. When you need to exercise again, when you, when your, you, your, your head understands like the needs that my body has are the needs that I have because we are united together organically, like what you need, I need. And so I gladly give you, I nourish and cherish my body because that's me. That's what it means when Paul says that Christ himself has been given to the church. He doesn't hate that it's you asking for that again. He delights to nourish and cherish the members of his own body. We can have confidence when we pray In Jesus' name. More than that, Paul goes on, that the church, the the body of Christ, he says, is the fullness of him. Do you see that? Are your eyes on seeing what I'm seeing? The fullness of him who fills all in all. That is not just nice sounding words to end the prayer. This idea of fullness in the Bible starts with the tabernacle. Goes all the way through, but it starts with the tabernacle. And the idea is that the full, when the fullness of God fills a place, like the Holy of Holies, what's being said there is that the presence of God and the power of God are known. The presence of God is felt. The power of God is known when his fullness is present. And of course, wonderfully, preeminently in the New Testament, Jesus is the fullness of God. In him, all the fullness of Colossians 1.19, was pleased to dwell. Jesus is the place, the presence of God, the, the power of God, the character of God are perfectly known. But now, look at this. Now that Christ has ascended and poured out his Holy Spirit on his people, the church is described as the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 2, the end of the next chapter. We are being built up, the church is, into a dwelling place for God by the Holy Spirit. Colossians 2, 9, in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, fullness, dwelling, and, Paul goes on, you, plural, the church, have been filled in him. So the church is the place where the presence of Jesus and the power of Jesus and the character of Jesus and the life of Jesus are to be known, felt, experienced, edifying the believers and bringing in, evangelizing the lost. Isn't this amazing? Don't don't let this slip by as we kind of glide out of the end of this prayer. The church is the way that the world, the physical world, like your neighbor, And the spiritual world, like the powers, the church is the way the fullness of God in Christ is known. 
Ephesians 3.10, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Jesus starts by saying, I'm exalted over all. All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Then he goes on to say, you will be my fullness. You will be the place where my presence and power are experienced as you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the triune name and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded to you. And lo, I am with you as you go. The mighty power God worked in giving Christ as head to the church, which is his body, is cause for confidence in prayer because Jesus is invested in, having, in us having everything that we need for life and for godliness. Does that logic make sense to you? Does that land for you? Jesus has appointed that you are the place his presence and power are known. What will he not give you so that you have what you need to make his presence and power known? He will fill you with his Holy Spirit. He will give you the gifts that you need. He will strengthen you. He will help you. He will uphold you. He will come to you. He will teach you. He will assist you. He will answer your prayers because he wants his name lifted high in the church. He wants his life, his power, his presence to be felt and known. Listen, there's nothing that we need on mission for Jesus in the world that he won't give us in response to our prayer because that's his point. This is his design and his delight. So we can have confidence when we pray in Jesus' name because the Father raised him and seated him, because the Father exalted him above any and every other source of help, and because the Father gave this very Jesus himself to the church as the head of his body bringing others in to, to knowing the presence and the power of God. There is a cord, there's an accord, there's a link between God's mighty power at work in Christ and his promised power in response to your faithful, believing, persistent prayer. Amen? Christ is our cause for confidence in prayer. So how do we take this home? Learning to live. Three quick questions for you. Number one, is Christ your true confidence? All this talk about fullness and power and answer and sufficiency, and it all, it all starts with connection, right? Union, trusting, believing in Jesus as your Savior. Is that true for you? Have you seen your sin, seen the holiness of God, and run to Christ as the only savior for sinners. He's here today, mighty to save, trust in him. Is he your confidence? Number two, how can Christ be more exalted in your heart? And what I'm thinking here specifically is, do you feel your dependence and your need for him? Are your prayers the kind that stretch beyond your natural powers, your other sources of strength and help? Where are you placing confidence in other things beside Jesus? And you can tell the truth about his greatness with your life, with your prayer life, by going to him instead of any other source. And number three, remember, this is all about praying. Who should we be praying for in Jesus' name? Where do we need to exercise that Joyful, confident, persistent, bold prayer in Jesus' name, trusting that because of who Christ is and what he's done and God's mighty power at work in him, and we are in him, it will be at work as we pray for one another in the church, for our neighbors, for God's mission around the world. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for the privilege of prayer. We are grateful as we come to the place of prayer, that we do not put confidence in ourselves, in our own wisdom or strength, 
prayer by its very essence is a declaration of our dependence. We need you, God, to do what we cannot do. We need you, maybe some of us in this room right now need you to give us the desire to pray. We need help to pray. And then, oh, how we need your help as we pray. Lord, as we come to you, as we pray, looking away from ourselves, looking to Christ, as we pray in his name, would Christ be magnified? Would the lost be brought in? Would the saints be built up? Would we tell the truth of the Lord Jesus, his greatness, his goodness, with our prayer life? And we ask all this in his mighty name. Amen. Just stand with me as we close. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives in peace for me. My name is great. so great to worship with you this morning. If you need prayer, um, if you're carrying burdens, we'll have a team on either side of the stage that would love to pray with you and pray for you. We have gathered as God's people, and now we scatter on mission for him. And as you go, go with this truth stamped on your life, you are loved. Have a great week.